Welcome everyone to Disarming Americans, Museum's Take on Gun Control, our second Site Conscience Matters webinar of 2023, which will explore how sites of conscience and their allies can support productive conversations about gun violence and gun control in their communities. My name is Ashley Nelson, and I am the Director of Communications at the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, and will be moderating this discussion. For those of you joining us for the first time, the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, ICSC, or the Coalition for short, is the only global network of historic sites, museums, and memory initiatives that connect past struggles to today's movements for human rights and social justice. Founded in 1999, we now have over 350 members in 65 countries, from Ellis Island in New York City, to former centers of detainment in Argentina, to sites that remember and learn from the transatlantic slave trade in West Africa. While our members focus on a range of subjects, what connects them is their belief that history should be used as a transformative tool for positive change. At sites of conscience, memory is considered to be the best weapon civil society has against injustice. By remembering the world's most challenging periods, we give voice to those who have been historically silenced and sites of conscience seek justice for harms done so that peaceful futures may take root. In short, we preserve memory, we promote truth, and we pursue justice. For information on how to join the coalition, please visit our website. Our 2023 webinar series entitled, If Memory Serves on the Uses and Abuses of Remembering, examines the many roles memory plays in contemporary topics in conversations on social justice, from the war in Ukraine to Black Lives Matter, drawing on the experiences of survivors, scholars, practitioners, and most of all, sites of conscience for who over 20 years have <clears throat> functioned as laboratories designed to find the most effective ethical and equitable uses of memory. Webinars generally take place on the third Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. New York time, and we are followed a week and are followed a week later by a webinar short, which is a brief 20 to 30 minute webinar, usually offering sites of conscience and their allies more practical tools for using history to address social justice. Please visit our events page on our website for more information. Today, we are gathered together to consider and brainstorm the role sites of conscience and other cultural organizations can play in supporting productive conversations about what is frequently presented as an extremely polarized topic in America, gun violence and gun control. Our talk today will last about an hour. I'll begin with a short five to seven minute intro, and then we'll jump into our conversation. At their end, there will be a Q&A uh, at which time you'll be able to raise your hand and ask a question. You may also submit questions throughout the discussion in the Q&A box, although you will not be able to uh, chat in the chat box. As hosts and panels, we will see them and read the questions out loud from the, from the Q&A box. To begin, I'll begin with an admission. The topic today is an intimidating one as a moderator and perhaps as a panelist. Uh, for me, one of the challenges is that there are so many angles this conversation can go, so much so that we could easily have an entire series on this topic. There's a gendered approach to this discussion, given that more than two thirds of mass shootings or domestic violence incidences are perpetrated by shooters with a history of domestic violence. 98% of mass shootings are perpetrated by men. Racism and discrimination against minority groups, particularly African Americans, Asian Americans, and LGBT plus communities commonly manifest in gun violence. According to every town for gun safety, in an average year, over 10,300 hate crimes in the United States involve a firearm, more than 28 each day. Another conversation could focus entirely on mental health and the consequences of the expensive and often inadequate healthcare systems in America. In 2020, 54% of all gun-related deaths in the U.S. were suicides. What is clear from these a many angles is that guns in America are ubiquitous. For every 100 people in the country, there are 120 guns. And according to the Gun Violence Archive, which defies, defines mass shootings as one in which at least four people are shot, excluding the shooter, there have already been 72 mass shootings 
in 2023 alone. In other words, more mass shootings than days in the year. As many of you know, looking at modern repercussions of historical legacies is at the heart of what sites of conscience do. In this case, guns and gun culture also hold a special and often misunderstood status in American history or mythology. You can go back to the previous slide, Cassidy, thank you. In the political realm, while gun supporters often reference the Second Amendment, the notion that individuals be a, versus say a, a militia um, have a right to use guns for self-defense is a relatively new reading of the Constitution, which in two until 2008 was widely considered to only protect a collective right to use them. Similarly, while entertainment and advertising have long pushed a version of the Wild West that idealizes far firearms and outlaws, in reality, according to Robert Dykstra in his book, Quantifying the Wild West, the problematic statistics of frontier violence, gun deaths rates in frontier towns we identify with the Wild West were actually quite low, in large part because those towns imposed restrictions we think of today as gun control, unquote. In the early 20th century, gun manufacturers and later lobbyists made a dramatic shift in marketing guns to Americans who are increasingly living and working in cities. According to Pamela Haig, author of The Gunning of America, guns went from being advertised as agricultural tools to be marketed as central to American masculinity, essential for protecting family and property and frequently with racist overtones. While we cannot dive into every possible angle, today's conversation will likely touch on aspects of all of them. Around the globe, dozens of sites of conscience have evolved out of a need to come to terms with either gun violence or the history of guns in America. Next slide. Some are the sites of assassinations, including the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis where Martin Luther King Jr. was gunned down. Others like the Rebuild Foundation in Chicago have preserved spaces where gun violence has occurred, such as a park gazebo, the park gazebo, where 12 year old Tamir Rice was gunned down by a white police officer while playing with a replica toy gun. Still others, including many National Park, National Park Service sites who cater to politically diverse office, audiences have inherited vast collections of guns and don't always know how to effectively program around them without alienating huge swaths of their visitors on either quote side. While they each have a particular focus, sites of conscience remind us that we are so much more alike than we are different. Indeed, for all the talk of division and politics in the media, there can and must be movement on this, and I believe there's hope. According to a recent poll by the University of Chicago and the Associated Press, 71% of Americans say gun laws should be stricter, including about half of Republicans, the vast majority of Democrats, and a majority of those in gun-owning households. And on a personal level, as someone who is a firm believer in gun control, I admit I grew up partly in Tennessee and have oddly fond memories of shooting cans off of a fence with my father as a child. As a mother, I can't imagine it now, but he did it and I enjoyed it. And all that is to say, I truly believe for all the talk of red states and blue states, there's a lot of purple out there that we can tap into to create more peaceful societies. We're here to explore today how sites of conscience can effectively help us do that. Um, I'm putting one reference in the chat box now, a front page dialogue guide designed by our methodology and practice team to help you have conversations across difference with your audiences about gun control. We will also be sharing a recording of this conversation with registrants and include that, uh, including that related resources. But now without further ado, I'm going to stop talking and introduce our wonderful panelists. Um, in alpha order, we have Jake Flack, Deputy Director of Education from our member site Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., the, uh, the theater where President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated um, by John Wilkes Booth with a gun. There, Mr. Flack develops and manages all aspects of the student program with a focus on D.C. public school students and teachers. We'll hear today about how the museum has grappled over decades with how to present this history, including how to conduct programming around the subject of firearms, as well as its suggestions for how sites with guns in their collections can prompt conversation about reducing gun violence. I'm also thrilled to welcome Dr. Earl Mohat, 
who, in addition to being a published author on race relations, is the vice president of education at One Pulse Foundation, a site of conscience in Orlando, Florida, created in honor of the 49 people killed and 68 others injured at the Pulse nightclub, an LGBTQ plus friendly club in June, 2016. The foundation supports the design, construction, maintenance, and operation of a memorial and museum, as well as community grants to care for victims, families, and survivors, educational programs to promote amity among all segments of society, and endowed scholarships to honor each of the 49 killed. Dr. Moet helps steer the foundation's vision of acceptance, inclusion, and remembrance in the education, into the education programs. Thank you both for being here today. I'll start um, with Jake. As a site where um, political violence occurred, specifically the assassination by a firearm of President Lincoln, Ford's theater has long struggled with the ethics of displaying the pistol that killed the president. From the time of Lincoln's death in 1865 to 1940, in fact, the weapon was deemed unequivocally inappropriate to display by the US Army Judge Advocate General who was in possession of the weapon. In response to a 1931 request by Ulysses S. Grant on behalf of Ford Theater, the office responded, the relic should not be displayed to the public under any circumstances on the theory that they would create interest in the criminal aspects of the great tragedy rather than the historical features thereof, and would have more of an appeal for the morbid or weak-minded than for students of history. The Lincoln relics should not be placed on ex exhibition anywhere. Eventually, the gun did make it to Ford's theater and was put on display in 1942, where it has remained ever since. Jay, can you start us off by talking about how conversations about displaying uh, the gun at Ford's have evolved over the years? And specifically, I'm curious about those leading up to the 2020 decision to post a plaque asking visitors whether they felt it was appropriate to display a murder weapon. What prompted sure. you to bring visitors into the discussion? Sure, first of all, to say, Ashley, thank you so much for including me in today's conversation. It really, I'm honored to be here. Um, yeah, so, you know, at Ford's Theater, we do display the single shot Derringer pistol that John Wilkes Booth used to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. And um, that actual gun has sort of gone gone through an interesting history. Um, immediately following the assassination, the gun was just dropped in the theater box lobby and it was found the next morning by someone who went into the box to find their keys, which they had lost. Um, and because the Lincoln conspirators were tried by a military tribunal rather than a civil court, um, the gun was put into evidence and was in the possession of the army. The uh, judge advocate general's office was prosecuting the military tribunal and they they held on to the to the uh, to the Derringer um, ultimately until 1942 when the National Park Service took over Ford's theater and all of the artifacts associated with it. But actually the letter that you're referring to was written in 1931 when Ulysses S. Grant III, um, the grandson of, of the, the United States general and then later president, um, was petitioning to have some of the artifacts displayed in a new museum exhibit that was opening in the 1930s. And the uh, judge advocate general said, absolutely not. You know, we found this letter in the archives that this, this, this general wrote. Um, and the reason was, as you said, was that um, the thinking was that by displaying this weapon, it might appeal to sort of, as he put it, the, the morbid, the people with morbid curiosity, and it might possibly influence dereliction or other sort of poor behavior. Um, and so the gun was not displayed. But in 1942, and once the Park Service had taken over the site, um, they did an exhibit in conjunction with a military tribunal that was happening during World War II, in which um, eight German saboteurs landed on the coast of Long Island, and they were planning to blow up bridges and damage the infrastructure of the United States. They had this very public trial in Washington. And so you know, they sort of brought out the similarities between the tribunal of the, of the conspirators and then what was happening during World War II. Um, 
all that to say, you know, that's a long way of saying that since 1942, the gun has been on display. In 2018, Ford Theater um, went into a process of redoing our interpretive plan for the entire site. So in partnership with the National Park Service and the Ford's Theater Society, um, we worked with um, the coalition to help develop this interpretive plan. And we started to think about the, the gun, as we call it. And, you know, was it the display that we had, was it too reverential? Were we putting too much emphasis on this single artifact? And what we, we decided to do was ask our visitors what they thought. And so um, we sort of, we rolled out some expanded interpretation. We included some eyewitness accounts of people who were either in the theater that night or in Washington, which was greatly impacted by this tragedy. Um, and then, you know, sort of asked visitors, we put up a plaque, a sign next to the, the pistol, inviting um, people to weigh in on the question of whether or not should a weapon that was used in a murder be on display or not. And we got close to a thousand responses. And interestingly, 93% of the people said it's okay to display this um, weapon associated with the Lincoln assassination, whereas 7% said no. And of the 93%, about half said it's, it's okay to display a weapon like this um, after all the immediate um, relatives of the victim have died, which I, I found interesting and I don't really exactly have a, a good interpretation of what that means, but I think that there is some sort of not defined set of time over a defined set of years, but it seems like the longer something's happened, of course, we're talking about something that happened 158 years ago, might affect people's um, opinion on whether or not this should be displayed. So the gun is sort of had this long journey and in, in ways mirrored a lot of the things that the country was going through too. Thank you so much. And I'm, I might just follow up. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges um, at Sites of Conscience, we're constantly trying to sort of um, have, have these difficult conversations and guns today often spark very emotional responses from both sides of the political divide. Um, and like many of our members, I think you're a site of conscience that I imagine draws visitors who represent a range of political viewpoints. You know, there's some, some sites of conscience where they're probably mostly progressive <clears throat> visitors, but many, many welcome, welcome people from a, a diverse um, group. Um, can you talk about any strategies you may have for engaging audiences in productive conversations around divisive topics like this? Um, anything you would like to share for those many out there who may be struggling with how to how to manage um, you know visitors with different opinions sure so um, you know we're a, we're a nonpartisan site and we welcome everybody um, and the subject matter that we deal with is you know it's not just about President Lincoln's assassination but it's about the Civil War and that can still be one of the most divisive topics in American history today the issues around it, um, you know, sort of differing opinions on why, you know, how important it is today, why it started, what the impact of slavery was. Um, and so one of the things that we do is we use a lot of primary source material in our interpretation and our programming. And so we look at things that were written and said by people who were there during the Civil War, whether it's President Lincoln, uh, whether it's Frederick Douglass, whether it's eyewitness accounts of everyday people, that way we're grounding our interpretation in not not our beliefs, but in actually what people said. Um, the other thing I, I think is very has been very helpful for us. Um, I mentioned that we we developed this interpretive plan uh, with the help of the coalition, and in that we have foundational truths. And then we have some non-negotiables built in. And one of the foundational truths is that Ford's Theater is a site of political violence. And so we believe, you know, everybody in our organization and at the Park Service shares that value that this is a place not where sort of this lone rogue gunman acted, but this was actually 
a, a, an act of political violence designed to injure the United States government. And unfortunately, the president of the United States was a, a victim of that. And so by having these sort of foundational truths, everybody can work off that sort of ground floor of interpretation. And then similarly, the, the, the non-negotiables are sort of lines in the sand that you can draw. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that we believe is that the Civil War, the root cause of the Civil War was slavery. You can say it in one word, slavery. So if you, you know, if you have a discussion with someone and they might have a differing viewpoint, you can say, well, tell me more about what you're thinking. You know, why do you think that? But if it gets contentious, you have that sort of defense protection of that non-negotiable. And I think that, you know, um, the coalition really helped us in that, you know, using the arc of dialogue and um, just provided a lot of really useful tools for having these types of discussions. Thank you. Um, that's very helpful. Earl, I'll turn to you. Um, One Pulse Foundation seems to be above all a place for sanctuary, a place of reflection to honor those uh, who lost their lives or were injured there. In your mission statement, you speak about the memorial being a place that opens hearts and minds. How do you balance all the emotions that that space must naturally hold? Um, do you ever find it hard to juggle the advocacy component of your mission with the emotional weight of the topic? And if so, what strategies have you found to work through that with your visitors as, as well as your staff? Um, uh, first of all, um, Ashley, thank you for inviting One Pulse into this space. It is an absolute honor. And this is important work that um, uh, Slice of Conscience is doing. So um, I'm pleased to be here this morning. So um, in that space, right, it, it really is hard, right? You know, we can, no matter how long you've been working there and involved in this work, immersed in it, each time you go to the site, the memorial, it really takes an emotional toll, right? Especially for people that are from Orlando and how it has impacted Orlando. And um, I know for, for even when, um, in our team meetings, oftentimes, you know, sometimes we gotta cry about this stuff, right? To just get that catharsis energy to keep moving forward. And that does help. Um, so you can't separate the emotional from the work that we're doing, but there's some things that drive us, right? That drives us, that drives me. And then you think about the 49 angels, right? And we pour our energies into honoring them. I know with the education program, the education for me absolutely must capture, embody the spirit of the angels that we lost. So it has to be um, interesting. It has to be engaging. It has to be fun to an extent, right? It has to be all these things that embody our angels because it really is an, an honor to them. So that, you know, keeps us moving. We also provide that space at the memorial for reflection. So when people come there, right? And it's an honest portrayal of, of what's happened. So people have that space to reflect their quiet spaces and um, you know, that people can, can just reflect on. But where we find strength also is, it was a tragic incident, right? But it brought communities together disparate communities, communities that never would engage, it brought them, everyone, to a point of shared humanity and understanding. And if there's ever a driver to move this mission forward, it is that. Because you know what that does? That inspires hope. And with hope, then we can get connected towards a goal, um, a goal of change, acceptance, inclusion, and remembrance. So. Um, I don't know if that answered everything, but um, if there's anything else I'll be more than happy to share out. It absolutely, it, it was, it, it absolutely did. And thank you. And thank you for joining us. I think just to follow up, I think one of the challenges I imagine about productively talking about gun control is that the conversation can easily, as I suggested, cross into many other complex topics. Um, including, as I said, the inadequate treatment of mental health in this country, 
and the infusion, the increased infusion of hate speech into everyday lives. Most of the people killed at Pulse were young, LGBTQ+, and Latinx. In recent years, we've seen other mass shootings clearly target similarly marginalized groups, including African Americans and Asian Americans. At One Pulse, is it ever tempting or more productive to separate the gun issue from the hate crime aspect of it? In your view, is it okay to do that? At, at museums and memorials, you know, do you have any strategies for effectively addressing how to address these intersecting uh, issues? Yes, I'm glad that you um, asked. And that is one thing. We, um, we, we express a shared humanity, right? That brings everybody together. So the thing is, is that um, when we talk about um, gun control and other areas, those are polarizing things, right? So we understand that. We understand that. So we don't really, really try to take a position on that. And we're also nonpartisan, right? So you can't even get too engaged in that. But what we do, our strength is what is reflected in what happened, the communities coming together, understanding a shared humanity. So it's really just um, changing the language a little bit, right? From terrorism to community, to unity, to, again, I go back to acceptance, inclusion, and shared humanity. So what we try to do at One Pulse is, 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 is you know, the debris of that polarization, let's get rid of it and just focus on what it is that brings us together. And that's our shared humanity. So that is our approach um, in engaging people. Um, at, you know, put my sociology hat on. Yeah, these things are, these other things, terrorism and they, or, or um, gun control, they are divisive. So, um, you know, they can polarize. So again, we try to go the opposite around, change the language around a little bit, right? Let's talk about this shared humanity approach. And, but I do want to mention too, that um, I think that one thing that we need to look at that we don't look at enough is um, a holistic approach to healthcare. So we tend to really focus healthcare in the United States as just physical health, right? But I think that if we make it holistic and the World Health Organization has reported on this several times, we actually include mental health to make to normalize that, right? So we get, as we get, you know, annual checkups, we get annual mental uh, checkups. And I think that can be a change um, agent, if you will, in how, in preventing these harms from occurring in the, in the future. I think that's a really good point. In my research for this, I read the American Psychological Association has put out a study recently. I'll include it in the email of references um, that describe the just emotional and mental toll that these mass shootings take on everyone, uh, that people have started to change their behavior, to, fear, to feel fearful in spaces that were once considered safe, um, so I do think it's taken a toll. Another statistic I read was nearly 60% of Americans have been touched um, either personally or someone they've known has been touched by gun violence. So 60%. Um, it's, you know, it's certainly, I think, a mental health. Um, it's taking its toll. Um, Jake, I want to return to you and just, I, I really like this focus on survivors and shared humanity as a way to um, shift the narrative away from the polarization we see all, you know, so frequently in media and politics. Um, so whether filling in the gaps of history is decades old or working in countries where violence is quite fresh, sites of conscience are um, always committed to amplifying the voices of the unheard. Specific, specifically marginalized and survivors. Um, this not only provides, um, you know, it provides a useful tool to engage, I think, broad audiences. So sharing the stories of survivors or witnesses to violence not only helps provide a more complete narrative, but can spark healing in the community by engendering empathy and understanding. And in my research, I see that one of your programming prompts has children um, and perhaps older audiences too, enter the story of Lincoln's assassination through the firsthand account of a witness named Julia Shepard. Um, you spoke a little bit about this, but perhaps you can talk about why this is such a powerful entry point for discussing these topics. Sure. Um, well, we really decided that, that 
witness accounts, whether or not it was a witness who was in the theater that night during the assassination or someone who was in Washington would provide such rich, valuable context for what was happening and also to illustrate the impact that this gun did have. And the letter that you refer are referring to, uh, the Julia Shepard letter, um, again, these are primary source documents. So this was written four days after the, the assassination. It really captures the mood. It's a letter that she's writing to her father describing what, what the city's like since the assassination. And it really captures this mood in Washington um, that went from one of complete joy when President Lincoln walks into the theater um, Robert E. Lee had surrendered his his army um, four days late earlier, five days earlier, and there was this just sense of sheer joy and celebration throughout the nation's capital. Everyone was so relieved that the war was coming to an end, that this endless death and killing was stopping, um, that the danger to the government was over. And so Lincoln comes to the theater to be part of this sort of shared sense of, of celebration. And then that that small little pistol that's used to assassinate him completely reverses that collective mood to one of despair and grief and anger and uncertainty. And so this eyewitness account really captures that because she's talking about the celebrations that are going on. And then in the next paragraph, she's talking about the black mourning cloth that's draped from the windows of all the buildings in the city showing that the city and, and by extension a lot of the country is in mourning. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's really important to ground what we're doing in these primary source primary sources. Another one that we have um, is actually a diary that John Wilkes Booth himself carried during his escape. It's in our museum. And uh, Booth was on the run for 12 days before he was shot and killed by um, United States cavalry officers when he was in a barn in Virginia. But his plan was to travel through Southern Maryland and into Virginia. And he was hoping that when he made it into Virginia, which of course was one of the primary Confederate states, if not the most important one, um, having the capital in Richmond, he thought he'd be welcomed as a hero. And during his 12 day escape, the the young man who was traveling with him they would travel at night and then in the daytime hide out in woods and barns and things like that. This accomplice gets a couple of newspapers and he brings them back to Booth and Booth reads the reactions of what he did. And this is in Maryland too. Remember, Maryland is a border state that had the system of slavery. It did not join the Confederacy, but it was definitely heavily pro Confederate sympathies, because obviously, you know, it's a slaveholding state. Maryland newspapers are saying, oh, my gosh, what Booth did is terrible. It was it's going to set the set the uh, sort of the, the process of reconstruction back farther. Lincoln had already said in his final couple of speeches that the tone that he was going to take was one of reconciliation and healing. He said, we're going to bind up the nation's wounds and sort of as Earl referred to this, this collective sense of, of, you know, people joining together to make things better. That was Lincoln's stance. And, you know, when Booth does this, it sort of sets all of that back. And, and he, he died knowing this, that this was the reaction, that people didn't think he was heroic, but, you know, sort of the opposite of that. So again, by providing all of this context, it removes sort of the, um, the focus on the actual object, which is the, the actual pistol that Booth used, but brings in a lot more context on sort of the devastation that that small little gun um, really implemented. I think that's such an important point. And um, no matter, we, you know, we have sites of conscience all over the world and restoring the collective trauma. I mean, I mean, addressing the collective trauma um can take decades you know but it's really <clears throat> vital to sustain um and sort of found a more peaceful just systems earl i was similarly really moved by one of your initiatives at one pulse uh, which is to offer scholarships in honor of each victim in both their name but also explicitly awards that are designed for their specific vocations, hobbies, or life aspirations. Um, 
emphasizing the humanity. And I'm curious if you work with families of victims as well, because that can be a very um, powerful, powerful way to work, uh, we have found. For other sites of conscience who may be considering or contemplating programs to keep the memory of those lost um, to mass shootings uh, alive in meaningful ways, can you talk about the initiative um, and what it means to you? Yeah, um, I, yeah, and I, and I can. I love to talk. Boy, if you want to see it, bring a smile on my face. Let me talk about the scholarship program, right? Um, but I, I will start before I even get into that. I was working in my office, and then we had a visitor, right? It's this young man that came in, and we were talking about the work that we're doing um, against, you know, anti hate crime. And then he was so moved that he sent a communication to me how can I get engaged? like do an internship or do something like that. So I say all this, I mean, that, that really touches us when we do it at One Pulse. It shows that we're doing something, people are getting it, and young folks are, the, are getting it. That's even more, uh, you know, um, uh, motivating. And so God bless, right, um, that this is where we are. So um, that did do something to my heart as the scholarship programs as well. So to date, we've awarded over $900,000 in scholarships to young folks that are, you know, carrying on the hopes and dreams of the 49 angels. And um, so here's the thing with these scholarship programs, right? They, um, these scholarships, they run a gamut for, of, of disciplines from cosmetology, cosmetology to um, medical, right? Professions and they're not the typical scholarships that have these disqualifiers based on GPA, how many organizations you belong to, all these things are the disqualifiers, right? No, they look at the holistic person, um, student, and they look at how they connect to our 49 angels. And when you listen to their stories, oh my gosh, and then what they're doing with these scholarships in advance, advancing inclusion and acceptance, it is, um, it's just amazing. I tear up when I hear them say the work that they are continuing through their academics and how it's uplifting other lives and also honoring the lives of the 49 angels. So we do have a mechanism where the angels, their families are encouraged to apply and we have had um, their family members apply and, and be awarded scholarships. So it's just a beautiful way to honor the, the 49 lives and do some social good, right? And, and just, I don't know, so I, I can't speak uh, enough of how happy the foundation is in establishing that program. That, that is wonderful. Um, I'll, I'll just follow up. Um, let me see here. Um, there's so many places I could go. Let's see, uh, but Jake, I'm gonna say, um, I know for a fact that Ford's Theater is hardly the only historic site or museum to have to deal with divisive objects that represent to some maybe sense of freedom and self-protection and to others a great deal of pain. Um, across America, there are revolutionary war sites, civil war sites, and many others that have somehow or other inherited a musket or many muskets along the way. And I know through the grapevine of cultural heritage, that they often really struggle to present such artifacts in a way that supports their ideals, and their beliefs in justice and human rights. Do you have any advice, and you touched on some of it, uh, for how sites can start thinking about this, either internally as a staff um, or you know, as, a, as a member of their community? Well, I think, you know, a couple of things that I have mentioned is it's been really useful and helpful for us to be um, a member of the coalition and to tap into the resources and tools that you all have um, for facilitating dialogue. I mentioned the arc of dialogue, um, just helping with our interpretive plan. Uh, and also, you know, I also referenced asking our visitors what they think. And I can't speak for other sites, but for us, it has worked to you know, just ask them what they think about displaying the gun that was used to kill Abraham Lincoln, and I and you know, overwhelmingly, people said yes as sort of a historical artifact. Um, 
but I think the real the real focus should not be on the the object, but but, but the impact that it had. So if we're able to use that as a starting point to foster dialogue about the impact of this violence and what it meant, um, not just for President Lincoln, but for our country, for our government. And so, you know, when we're working with students, we we sort of, we have a discussion about, you know, do you think John Wilkes Booth was successful or not? And while yes, he did murder Abraham Lincoln, his larger plan to topple the American government or cripple it, badly enough to allow the Confederates to reorganize and continue the fight and, you know, ultimately win the Civil War and keep slavery going did not happen. And so, um, you know, by sort of providing that context and encouraging those dialogues, I think it takes the emphasis off the object and sort of more places it more on the impact and things that we've learned since then. It's a really good Great point. Um, I have one more question before we'll take some questions from the audience. As we have the audience, we have a few. Um, Earl, there are so many communities that have been traumatized by mass shootings. Um, but I imagine, given that they often take place in public settings, um, you know, from grocery stores to uh, ballrooms, um, that memorializing these spaces can be challenging. Uh, what sort of concrete recommendations do you have for communities looking to create memorials or spaces of reflections for victims and survivors of mass shootings, even if they are just small first steps? How did, um, is, maybe you can even just describe what the memorial at Pulse, you know, looks like and, and feels like in that space. Yes, well, we, um, the building, the memorial, the nightclub itself is maintained and it does serve as the memorial, it's an interim memorial, right? So we're still um, working and developing it. But honestly, you know what? Okay, so there are two things, right? The first is um, it's a huge undertaking. Do not feel, if, the, if say this happens in your space, right? Do not feel like you're alone. Reach out to other communities that have been impacted. Reach out to One Pulse Foundation, our, um, President, all right, is more than happy to help share her story. I'm talking Barbara Poma. Reach out to Oklahoma City, 9-11, um, because they have blueprints, right? And they can tell you what the struggles, areas, you know, points of concern, how to create this wonderful space that, um, you know, a lot of people are looking to do. So it's a huge undertaking, but you're not in it alone. And um, just reach out to communities that have been impacted. That's the best. Um, uh, thing that uh, first step because I could imagine if something like this happens in your space it's like you know you you're like what do we do right but there are resources and your best resources people that have been impacted the other thing that I do want to share too is that you know we do a um culture of remembrance um an annual culture of remembrance uh, uh um, symposium and we we meet with experts in this area developing memorials and um, and things of that nature. And we coalesce and we talk about how do we make these things happen, right? How do we memorialize things that have happened? How do we develop them? And, um, you know, uh, just have conversations around that. And I'm so grateful for Sites of Conscience because Sites of Conscience really helped us recruit um, uh, individuals I mean, presenters for this. So I'm going to be reaching out again soon. This conference, I mean, symposium is going to be September 28th and 29th, and I'll share that with you. But that is really a space where we have conversations on memorials, building them, um, best practices. And when we did it last year, um, we had so many ideas, and there have been memorials that have been initialized in the initial stages of, of development. So those are the two things I would share really is reach out to communities that and space that have been impacted. And if you can attend our um, cultural remembrance, then that will be in September. That's wonderful. Thank you. And yes, I'll just share for those of you who are members or may not be as engaged or understand, we at the coalition are here for you. <laughs> so if you have a question or don't know how to get started, uh, we have many outlets. We can connect you with other sites of conscience who have been through similar experiences throughout the world um, so they can share their lessons learned. We offer training 
uh, for members and non-members. <clears throat> Those can be short-term trainings or sort of longer consultancies if you really need to sort of initiate maybe staff change or you know um, really want to take on a, a sort of revamping of your exhibit. So um, that is what we are here for. And um, I'm so delighted to hear that we've been of, of some help to you and that your conference last year, Earl, was amazing. So I'm excited to hear it's happening again. Um, let me see, we're gonna take some questions from the audience. We have um, a phone-in caller, uh, Emlyn, who is a cherished member of our ambassador circle. So Emlyn, I'm gonna allow you to talk. So you should, I think, if you unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Thank you very much. Uh, um, do I, am I heard now? Yes, you are. Okay, thanks. The, the dialogue has been uh, very um, wonderful. Um, the backgrounds and perspectives of the two speakers, I, I think um, for me, take the uh, webinars or conversations with Sites of Conscience into a new dimension to put, contemporize you know, the, the mission of Sites of Conscience with a topic like this, although you're leaning on a historic example. What I want to just um, throw into the chat is, or the conversation is that, um, as someone who um, has, is very uh, concerned and passionate about uh, the need for museums of all type to, to find ways to be more relevant to consequential matters, and I think museums think they do that, but I, in many ways they do not. I I'm, have just finished writing an opinion, a point of view for the annual meeting edition of the uh, American Association Alliance of Museums Museum Magazine, which is called, um, which, which refers, I'll just be brief, to a, a very enlightening review in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago on the new Resistance Museum in Amsterdam. Uh, and I recommend uh, it be looked at. Um, this is a museum which uh, uh, traditionally, you know, looked at uh, the resistance movement in its time and place in the Second World War in, in, in Holland, but in the um, revamping of it, is consciously wanting to introduce, as the director says in the interview, complexity and nuance by representing uh, all of the participants in the resistance movement, from the Nazis themselves to the resistance um, uh, advocate activists, to the general public, to, to the uninvolved public. It's trying to create conversation. So I think what this says to me, and which I think is relevant to this dialogue you're having this morning, is that, you know, if, if I'm generalizing, yes, but in general, I think museums have for too long felt themselves to be an authority on one point of view and should, and I think this is relevant to what you're talking about with this historical, um, you know, a case in point, uh, need to be, they are more successful and they're more useful to society if, if the audience is, is prompted to reflect on their insights as a result of a more complex, nuanced experience, rather than just reading what the museum thought you should know. So I'm happy to talk about this more uh, in, in any follow-up conversation. It's something that I, I'm deeply involved in, and I'm, um, I'm thank you for just asking me to add my comment. Thank you so much, Emlyn. And if you would like to email me, you know, if there are any references, I can include it in the- It's in Ashley, the right, who's speaking? Yes, it is. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, your name's not on it, but I didn't want to get the wrong. I'll do that, actually. Thank you. Please, yes, do. And I did, Earl or Jake, did you want to add anything or had any thoughts? We have a couple other questions as well. Um, yeah, well, I, I just want to, wanted to, uh, to piggyback on that. And, and yes, um, I think that, um, you know, if they book, if museums become more experiential in the learning, then it will be more engaging because sometimes just the, you know, we talk about language, right? Just the mere word museum, <laughs> you know, can disengage people. So, um, you know, we're learning from that and looking at an experiential uh, experience, if you will, in our design. Just, I'll agree with it. what Emily and Earl said is that like, you know, the goal is always to make um, the museum relevant relevant to the visitor and, and allow them to to you know be able to connect through their shared experiences with whatever content you're presenting. So it's definitely true that you don't want to just be sort of one sided and say this is what happened this is what what happened a long time ago. See you later. You want it to be really relevant for the visitor. So I think that like you know just 
an example when we when we did that uh, survey, inviting people to weigh in on whether or not the, the gun that we display should be should be you know in the museum. That's just a way of allowing our visitors to have a say in in the interpretation that we have. That's an excellent point. We also have a question from Ilsa Goldman. She says, thank you for hosting this program. Any suggestions on how to interpret sites that focus on the gun industry, particularly as it relates to advancements made in gun technology? Either of you have thoughts on that? Can you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry. Sure, sure. Uh, any suggestions on how to interpret sites that focus on the gun industry, particularly as it relates to advancements made in gun technology? Well, I, I wish that we I could chime in on that, but that's um, out of our purview, actually. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to offer too much on that. Okay, all right. Jake, would you? No, I'm not sure that I could add any expertise to that either, other than just to say that, you know, um, if you're if you're focusing on the technology, perhaps you could look at, at sites that, that explore other technologies in American history, whether it's the auto industry or, you know, communications tools or whatever, and see how they sort of look at something over, over time. But um, mm -hmm. that would be, that would be my only thought. I think that's a great point. We have a site um, in Baltimore, the Baltimore Museum of Industry, um, so there are a lot of sites in our member, uh, among our members that, that deal with the complex um, evolution of certain industries, you know, and how they have really changed the conversation. So I would encourage you to look through our, um, you know, our member list and, um, and always, you can always reach out to, to me or anybody on staff or email or on our staff page if you have more questions. Um, let me see, we have now a question from um, Christy uh, Palmer. Uh, is the question about the gun presence, let me just read it first. Um, this is a question mostly for Earl, I think um, about um, how you collect information um, sort of regularly and how to make sure that any surveys or input you um, you ask of your audiences and your visitors, how to sort of keep that going. So are your surveys and outreach ongoing? What sort of interactive ideas does the Pulse Foundation have for um, you know, being innovative, I think, and, and um, seeking out new opinions and new takes on the, on the issue? Yeah, um, uh, it's a great question, thanks for asking. Well, um, with the education programs, of course, we always do um, surveys after each program to see how well the program is, is how it's being received, and if there is um, change in, in understanding the problem. And happy to say that we always really score high on those um, measurements. In terms of um, reaching out to um, uh, collecting survey in general, yeah, we have a firm that does that, and they manage that We're constantly. Uh, testing the waters to see what people's perception of, of Pulse. And we're talking about stakeholders. We're talking about people that have been impacted, the communities at large. So it's an ongoing process with us. When we do this, we want to make sure that we are absolutely delivering something that's going to connect with people. And the only way that we can really do that is to have these ongoing surveys. And really, they are stratified, but everybody's included in that. And um, in terms of the museum development, same thing, you know, we assess, evaluate, uh, we have, a, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, the people that, that are doing that for us and, 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 and presenting all of that. And our goal really is to create a space that can, where we can imagine change, people coming in there, being engaged and being motivated to understand a problem and want to enact change. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jake, did you have anything to add? Or are you, I know. Just in, in agreement with Earl that that um, survey data and feedback is incredibly important. And we do that as well in pretty much all of our programming um, through informal surveys, through surveys that are sent, you know, using SurveyMonkey. If anyone else out there uses SurveyMonkey. Um, 
And then we've had actually, a, you know, we have some of our programs, professional evaluators go through sort of a long-term, more extensive um, evaluation of the programs. And it's really a great way to improve what you do and learn, learn from the people that you're serving. It really is. And just another note for um, members, uh, and really it's open to the public, uh, we have a resource center on our website where you can search for things like evaluation guides or toolkits or advice on how to start that. Because, you know, sites of conscience, some of us are huge and we have lots of uh, capacity and others are quite small. So our resource center really, I think, is a good place for all different sort of uh, sizes, sized organizations to help. I just want to thank Shannon um, Parrish, who put, um, I put it in the chat box. It's a link to um, a new humanities-based research center at Wesleyan University um, that might be able to um, particularly field a question about gun history and manufacturing. So that looks like a really great resource. Um, I'm going to wait a few more seconds and see if there's any final questions or any final thoughts from Earl or Jake. You, I so enjoyed this conversation and I'm so grateful to you. Um, let's see, I think we can put up the slideshow again, Cassidy. Can we get that up? All right, so I just wanna thank you again and I wanted to alert you to some upcoming events um, that we have. Our next three webinars include a conversation next Thursday at 11 with the new um, executive director of the forthcoming American LGBTQ plus museum. Uh, his name is Ben Garcia and our um, director of methodology and practice Braden Painter will be leading that short discussion. Um, uh, and then we will have another conscience member matters webinar on March 16th that will look at how to memorialize um, public sites of police violence against African Americans. Um, and then that will be followed up by a webinar short the following week on reparations. Uh, it will focus mostly on um, what we can learn from global context um, about reparations that might help us in America. Um, I would also love uh, if I'm going to initiate a poll, this is something new we do. It is completely anonymous. Um, I would, we would appreciate if you would fill it out. It really helps us. Um, I'm putting it up there now, feel free to um, answer it. It really helps us in future programming and to know what we're doing right and what we could do better. So um, it's up now, if I'll, I'll leave it up for a few minutes. Um, and as you, as you exit, uh, it would be so great if you could, um, if you could fill that out. Um, I hope it's working because usually, oh, there it goes. Okay, phew. <laughs> so we'll leave that up. But um, as everyone disperses, I will just thank uh, our wonderful guests again, Earl and Jake. It was so lovely to have you. Uh, thank you to all our attendees. I'm very grateful. Um, I'll leave it open just a little longer for those finishing the poll. But thank you so much for being here. And uh, we hope to hear from you soon. <laughs>